Good afternoon and welcome. Thanks so much for joining this edition of The Advance. I'm Kevin Roberts, your host. And you know, each week, if you tune in, that we cover the pressing issues of the day. I would like to think in the 18 months we've been doing this, that each of those issues is urgent, that we identify the problem well for you, and that perhaps most importantly, we give you solutions for taking action. Let me dare say, not intending to be engaged in hyperbole, keeping in mind I run a public policy shop, that I don't think of all of the dozens of episodes of this show that we've done, that there is a more important one than this one. You have to account for a little bit of my bias. Our guest this week is a close friend. He's Congressman Chip Roy, former TPPF colleague, but more important than that, he, as a member of Congress, who is courageous, not just with his opposing party, but with his party about not fighting enough for us. If President Trump captured anything, and sometimes my good friend and Congressman Roy uh, was at odds with President Trump, what Trump captured was the absolute irritation, the frustration that Americans have with elites in Washington who wake up each day trying to tell us what to do. And if the Texas Public Policy Foundation stands for anything, even beyond the specific policies we work on, it is that, it is fighting for you. And so I'm grateful that Chip would find the time amid this busy schedule, especially after yesterday's announcement of vaccine mandates for businesses and for 100 million Americans to be with us. And so I'm going to get out of the way here, Chip, and I'm just going to ask you the question, what in the world is going on in Washington, D.C. right now? Well, Kevin, first of all, great to be on. Always great to participate with my friends at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. I don't think there's any uh, organization uh, better situated and, and more engaged in fighting for freedom uh, in the sort of think tank space and uh, defending Texans. And so I appreciate that very much. And um, let me just take 30, 10, 30 seconds to say that there was very rare that I was actually at odds or disagreed with President Trump, particularly on policy matters. I thought they spent too much, thought they empowered Fauci too much. And then I disagreed on how uh, we ended up handling going up to January 6th. That's it. Other than that, uh, people that I represent, uh, President Trump represents the unrepresented. President Trump represents the people, represented the people, and I think still does, uh, people who felt forgotten. And, and that's germane to the question you just asked. We've got a president of the United States right now who is disregarding the constitutional uh, barriers uh, placed on the president, placed on Washington to not overstep its bounds. We saw that in full force yesterday. If you are an American who believes in liberty as you should, and I hope all listening to this do, you should be extremely concerned about what you heard the president of the United States say yesterday, blatantly disregarding the constitutional order to say that they had, he somehow has the power as the executive to mandate that businesses over a hundred in size must require that they've got people vaccinated or be mandatorily uh, tested. He does not have that power. There is no such power. It is in fact unconstitutional, but more than that, because I'm tired of my Republican colleagues thinking that we have to go settle every single one of these questions in the court, is it's just flat out tyrannical, right? It is, this is the time right now for every Republican governor and every representative in state houses, and frankly, those of us in Congress, to be standing up and pushing back. I've got a letter right now that I've drafted, I'm circulating among my colleagues, asking Governor Abbott to continue and advance upon what he has already done in terms of mandates, and to basically say that Texas is not going to facilitate any federal enforcement of these orders, and in fact will take steps to defend Texans from the unconstitutional, illegal, tyrannical overreach by Washington. They don't have the power to do it. If we can't stand up for freedom now, then what did is the guy I just talked to who broke up and, and choked up sitting in the parking lot of Tractor Supply in Dripping Springs, Texas, because his dad was one of the men that stormed Normandy and he could barely get it out. He was so angry about the state of what is happening to a country that so many of our forefathers fought, died, bled for. And that's the people that President Trump appropriately represented for four years and why that we need to uh, get back to representing those forgotten men and women. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that, that vigor. You know, as, as you and I were, were chatting before we went live, you said, oh, man, I'm, I'm in a feisty mood. And, and, and I asked you, well, you know, how is that different from any other day? And, <laughs> and, and there's, there's a compliment in that, Congressman, 
because, and I would say this if you were not my friend, we don't have enough members of Congress. We don't have enough governors. We don't have enough conservatives, so-called conservatives, who are willing to fight for what Trump really personified, which is that the elites have run this country way too long. And you've got so much evidence of that in the last couple of weeks, not just the vaccine mandate yesterday, but think about the ridiculous, tragic, embarrassing withdrawal from Afghanistan. And you've got colleagues in the Republican Party, members of Congress, who won't even force the president's hand to have to answer questions about that. We usually save solutions for the end of conversations, but I just want to jump to that now because I know from hearing members of, of our audience in the last 24 hours, they want to know what they can do. And let's just jump to that question, if you don't mind, before covering some other policy issues. What can the average person do that actually might affect change? Well, I would say right now there's two or three things. Number one, demand that your elected representatives, particularly in Austin, and I'm not trying to punt here, but particularly in Austin, uh, in Texas, uh, stand up against the long arm of the federal government. It has never been more important. From the governor's mansion to the state house, they've still got a third special session coming. Uh, let's do whatever we need to do to send a message to Washington that they cannot act unconstitutionally and they can't overreach. Number two, work locally up. We need to take over the school boards, take over the city councils, reclaim our communities because that's where we live. I'm gonna do everything I can to throw my body in front of the tyrannical train coming out of Washington, but we've got to take over our own schools. Doesn't do, any, do us any good to pat ourselves on the back for being Texas and how strong Texas is if we still don't have ownership of our schools. If we still have teachers in Texas teaching that America is evil and teaching critical race theory and doing all the things that we know that are happening at the local level in Texas. So we need to reclaim Texas we need to push hard on our elected representatives in Austin. And then thirdly, hold your federal representatives accountable in the Congress and the Senate and, and encourage your, your friends around the country and other states to do the same, to demand we take actual action. We need to move forward with articles of impeachment, calling out President Biden for abandoning Afghanistan, not faithfully executing the laws at the border, and now exercising abuse of power with respect to overreaching in the states. We need to demand that we have hearings in Congress right now for Milley, for Austin, for Blinken, for all of those involved in what would happen in Afghanistan. We need to have hearings on the border. We need to elevate these conversations. And importantly, ask yourself this question, and then I'll, I'll turn it over back to you. In April, I introduced a discharge petition on the floor of the House of Representatives to force a vote on the House floor because we can do that if we get 218 signatures, to force a vote on Yvette Harrell, our good friend from New Mexico's bill, to require Title 42 health care laws to be enforced at the border, which is what Donald Trump was using along with return to Mexico to secure the border. We have 150 signatures on that petition right now. Well, that's great, but where are the other 62 Republicans? Why aren't they on the petition? Why did I have to go on Tucker Carlson when I had about 110 signatures to get another 40 by calling them out on Tucker. Why won't our Republican leadership whip that bill? Or as I've said, no pride of authorship, come up with another bill. But mm -hmm. let's do discharge petitions. Let's force Democrats to have to take tough votes. Force Henry Cuellar and Abigail Spanberger and Democrats to answer tough questions about what we believe is important for how to govern, instead of just waiting to reclaim power in 18 months or reclaim power in two and a half years. Yeah, I, I think it's an excellent a synopsis of, of what we can do. And, and, and just to summarize, maybe even chronologically, I think a majority of our audience for this broadcast is from outside Texas. But the comments you made for those of you joining uh, us from Texas are relevant to anyone in any state. The, the point, the headline that we're writing, you're writing, we're writing in our work every day, is that the best way to push back against federal overreach is for states to exercise the authority they have. Red states, blue states, every state in between. And the frustration that is palpable in your comments and, and in mine is not just with the left, but with conservative Republicans in elected office who may just be doing 60 or 70% of what they could otherwise be doing. It's time for them to hit 100%. 
And I just look at that as a historian. We're going to get into some more solutions as we get into audience questions here in a little bit, Congressman Roy. But first, I want to move just move on from the vaccine mandate issue, maybe even add to the comments you made about Afghanistan soon. But we've got a huge spending issue in Washington that you more than I think any other member of Congress, maybe with just a couple of exceptions, have highlighted. Give us a sense of the scale of that problem of overspending. Well, Kevin, I think there may not be any more important question, and it often gets shoved aside for some good reason, honestly, right? It's, it's spending as a concept is never the issue that makes people wake up in the morning mad, right, per se. I mean, they're kind of generally frustrated, but they'll be frustrated about healthcare at one particular moment, and then they forget that, or they're mad about Afghanistan right now, rightly. The border has stayed hot for a while because it's been a perpetual problem. Or maybe it's crime in Austin where we've defunded the police. But now let's take a step back and say, why do we have these problems? And what I would suggest to you is that Republicans have failed now for two decades plus. Uh, and, and with all due respect to, to our great friend, Phil Grant, a great friend of TPBF, going all the way back to Graham Rudman, going all the way back to the early conversations about budget amendments. I agreed with all of that and I support all of that. But I think we've gotten a little too wonky about dollars and about numbers and about 25 trillion or 28 trillion or 30 trillion. I mean, does it matter? Do any of you listening to this care whether we're 28 trillion or 30 trillion dollars in debt? Does it make any difference to you tomorrow? I would argue that it does. We could bring Vance or one of the great economists at TPBF that's come in and say, well, that's why this matters to you. Inflation, undermining the dollar, weakness. Okay, but what is it really doing? It's funding tyranny. Every dollar that you're giving to Washington and that they are then printing more money and then borrowing more money, you are funding the bureaucrats that are undermining your liberty. Right now, that's what you're doing every single day. Why are we funding this? Why are we funding a Department of Homeland Security that is running processing centers in McAllen? Why? Why are we funding schools with local and federal tax dollars to teach our children that America is evil? to follow a flawed Supreme Court decision that we can't acknowledge our creator. Why are we doing that? Yet we just keep doing it and we keep funding more of it, right? Why do we continue to take dollars and give it to the federal government and more importantly, borrow money and rack up a whole bunch of debt to fund bureaucrats who are now being turned around to shut down our businesses, to shut down our schools, to have President Biden come in with HHS bureaucrats and presumably with some federal law enforcement behind it to say, we're going to make you businesses pay fines and enforce this stuff if you don't enforce vaccine mandates. Why are we doing that? Yet we do it all day long, every day. And we've got to stop it. We've got to recognize that this environmental tyranny, this healthcare tyranny, the collusion between government and big healthcare and corporations that is taking away your healthcare freedom and your ability to go to the doctor of your choice. We need to end it. End it now. And the best way to end it, take away their money take away their money and they die on the vine. And then we can get busy restoring our lives and our communities in Texas and every other state across this union that's tuned in right now. Yeah, and, and, and you know, not, not that I wanna end the indictment of, uh, of horrible things or, or the list of horrible things prematurely, but just to inject a little bit of optimism that I know you agree with because we've talked about it. Let's take the Texas legislature as an example. Not only have they, in contrast to other states, generally spent less, which, which doesn't mean that we've cut spending in the last 10 or 12 years, it just means that we've slowed the rate of, of, of growth. But this session, in the regular session, they made it statute, they made it state law, that they have to stay within a certain framework of spending. It would be better if, in fact, we were shrinking government, but maybe we'll, we'll get there. My point is this, in order for that to happen, most importantly, it took elected officials to muster a lot of fortitude a lot of courage to stand against special interest. I can tell you at TPPF, we took a lot of arrows by standing on principle, the same thing that happens to you in Washington, DC. But this is the point for people in the audience. We succeeded in doing that. And so never doubt the power of people and some elected officials when we can work together in correcting these problems. All of that to say, that in order to choke off, that if we in fact do choke off the government's spending or most of it, we're going to be able to gain on a lot of these issues. That, that leads us to this question though, Congressman. One of the places where we have spent a lot of money 
$85 billion, I would argue has not only gone down the drain, but far more importantly, there were thousands of American lives cost to try to take Afghanistan. And I can tell you certainly in my lifetime, I have never encountered a more embarrassing example of America at its worst than in President Biden's handling of the withdrawal in Afghanistan. I know this is on the minds of many in our audience. What's the answer there, given what has already happened? How, how do we somehow restore American integrity abroad? What's the answer to families whose loved ones were lost in that conflict? What's the future for American power abroad used responsibly? Yeah, well, obviously that question would be a question that we could do an entire hour on and have a longer conversation. We should and happy to come back to do it. Let me take 30 seconds to just say one thing on the spending front that you put a nice bow around just to say, again, on the optimistic side, I agree with you. We got to recognize that, look, the next 16 months for sure, and as long as Biden is there, we're going to have this battle on spending. Republicans right now are going to now talk a big game about spending. OK, mm -hmm. our job as conservatives from an optimistic standpoint is to box Republicans in to demand change the next time that they have power. No more free passes, okay? We know what we need to do. We're gonna to have to hold the line on the CR, hold the line on this ridiculous three and a half trillion dollar spending package, but we've gotta get in and get in power and then actually do our job to restrain Leviathan and grow the economy. With respect to Afghanistan, look, one thing out there, any veterans out there, any parents, siblings, children of veterans out there who fought in Afghanistan, uh, God bless you. Uh, that service was um, extraordinary and helped defend our country and helped take the fight to terrorists. And that will never be uh, changed in terms of history. And we're not going to be like 75 and how we treated Vietnam veterans. What we have to do now is recognize that what this current administration did was complete and total failure. But I, I want to look in the mirror to answer your question, Kevin, about what we do. We Republicans need to look in the mirror. We failed as well for years in not speaking clearly about our mission, clearly about what we expect, and frankly, being very real about the enemy, okay? You know, I was watching a documentary on 9-11 last night, and you watch within an hour of that building collapsing, you would talk to New Yorkers who were hot, and they were said, I want death. I want to kill people. I want bad guys. I want to go take them out. And President Bush had that resolve. Let's go get the bad guys. And that's great. And we did that. And then we took the fight to them. But we got a little distracted over the last 20 years. And we never really revisited the authorization of the use of military force. And had we done that, I think we would have boxed in, as the Congress is supposed to do under its war powers in the Constitution, boxed in the president about what our position is there, right? Established that we're supposed to have a position at Bagram. But maybe we shouldn't have a force of 10 or 20,000 over there throughout the country or nation building, but instead own Bagram, hold Afghanistan to account, tell the Taliban if they blink, we're gonna blow you up. And that ought to be our position, right? Is in our national security interest, recognize the Taliban is our enemy. With all due respect, neither Clinton, nor Bush, nor Obama, nor respectfully President Trump, nor the current administration, full on came out and recognized and said, the Taliban is in fact our enemy. We should treat them as such. We should treat them as the hostiles they are and go own Bagram, take a position and stand up for us. Why are we giving $35 billion to Pakistan and not demanding that Pakistan help us instead of undermining us? Why? We need to have a real conversation about our footprint around the world. We don't have unlimited dollars and we don't have unlimited blood. We need to stand up and defend our country with a clear mission, unapologetically and strongly in our defense and not walk away with our tail between our legs. But the people that went out and fought for us over the last 20 years, they're the heroes. They're the warriors that kept us safe. And they are whose legacy we're going to carry forward when we get back in power and do the right thing. Yeah. And so in short, the one of the answers, in fact, I would argue with you um, or, or along with you to the Afghanistan problem is the same issue that we're seeing on domestic policies, which is that the legislative branch is not exerting its authority. And even members of our movement, the conservative movement, are allowing that to happen, sometimes actively participating in it. We could have a whole live stream on that. Maybe we will one day. But I want to get to one other question I have for you before getting to the uh, a few of the, the many questions from the audience. And that is, you and I, for a, a while, have been concerned about this steady march 
toward drafting women. And that reared its head last week. It's, it's gotten lost in the shuffle of a couple of news cycles since then. But you're a dad of a daughter. I'm a dad of three. Even if I were not a dad of daughters, I would be concerned about this. You and I are both frustrated to kind of come full circle in this conversation with the participation in this bad idea by members of the conservative movement, some of your colleagues. Highlight that for our audience, because I think that's really gotten lost in the shuffle of some of this news. Yeah, for those who don't know, you may not know because of all the news that have been garnishing, you know, headlines. Uh, you know, the uh, National uh, Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA, uh, was moving through the Senate, and an amendment was offered uh, by a Democrat. I can't remember which one at this point to require the draft to be expanded, or I should say, to, to require the registration for the draft, selective service, to be expanded to uh, women. Um, I oppose that, um, and we can talk about why in detail if we want. But at the end of the day, uh, a number of Republicans in committee voted for it. I can't remember the exact number, I think nine. Uh, then that NDAA was passed out of the Senate. Um, now we've got NDAA votes in the House. And in the House, we had several Republicans on the Armed Services Committee vote for it. And a number of Republicans that are publicly out there saying that we should support it. Now, I strongly disagree with that. And I think the vast majority of the American people that I, certainly the Texans that I represent, disagree with that. Now, I understand some libertarian minded friends and say, well, we shouldn't even have a draft. If you're going to have a draft, well, you know, you know, you got to make sure it's applying equally and so forth. Like, Hold on a second. I don't accept that premise, first of all. Uh, if you want to get rid of the draft, let's have that debate. OK, but if you're going to have a draft, I'm going to stand up and shout from the rooftops that I'm OK and believe in having a draft if you need it. We haven't needed it for years uh, for able bodied men. OK, I I'm going to say that. That's what I believe. And I think that's what most people I represent actually believe if they're not believing and buying into this woke nonsense. And unfortunately, many members of Congress buy into this woke stuff. And they'll say things like, well, look, Israel, they've got women in the, you know, in the mandatorily participating in the military. Well, first of all, we're not Israel, a whole lot of levels. Second of all, and we're 330 million people with an enormous volunteer military. Second of all, they've got an entire world surrounding them and they're, they're facing a different environment than we do. Third of all, women don't have to participate in the military. They can opt in and go do other public service. And fourth of all, I don't really care, right? We're, we're American. I want to choose how to take care of my family. And I'm not going to allow my daughter to be forced into selective service to go have to sit in a box hole in Afghanistan to have who knows what happened to her because Joe Biden is an incompetent fool who endangers Americans in general, much less our women. And I think that's what's at stake. Yeah, yeah, well, well said, and, and thank you for that. The we could talk more about that, but I, I do want to extend the courtesy to our audience to to get as, to as many questions as as they as we can. And I know that's always your interest, so we'll do that. Uh, we've covered a couple of these already, Congressman Chip Roy. But uh, let's see, we'll we'll take this one, which is coming back to the vaccine mandates. This audience member asks, when it comes to the vaccine mandates, how do I keep my livelihood without giving in to this tyranny? Well, I think that's the $64,000 question for a lot of Americans right now. And what I would do is encourage you to hold the line. Um, I understand, and I've had a lot of conversations with business owners, some that have publicly traded components, they got to deal with institutional investors, some who are dealing with concern and litigation. Uh, I had some good conversations with some uh, you know, business owners who have 100 plus employees today who told me they're not giving in, they're, they're saying no, uh, good. I encourage that. I encourage you to hold the line. I believe it is unconstitutional. There are smart lawyers out there who are going to try to fight it. I hope we can get some injunctions in place. Uh, and at some point here, I think this is part of the problem. Uh, we've got to figure out how far we're willing to go to fight for freedom, knowing that there's a cost to it. And when, when tyranny is being oppressed upon you, that's the question. Right now, there's mask mandates on the floor of the House. Some of us have been arguing back against those mask mandates, believing the American people should see their representatives unmasked. And, you know, I got a $500 fine the last time, and that just came through. Uh, the next one would be a $2,500 fine, a $5,000 fine. So I'm having to weigh these questions as well and figure out how I can do my duty to represent you. But I would just encourage you to, you know, pray, hold the line, do what's right for you and your family. You can make that judgment. But try to hold the line and know that there's a lot of us out there defending. I'm sending a letter to Governor Abbott today calling on the governor and the state to stand alongside you and behind you and try to prevent the feds from overreaching. We'll do everything we know how to do. Well, thank you for that. Let me ask a quick follow-up question because 
And this is relevant even if, if uh, you're tuning in and you're outside Texas, because uh, let's, let's be honest, um, it can be difficult even in Texas to get good policy passed, but we're on a heck of a winning streak right now. And so our legislature comes back in for their yep. third special session, ostensibly about redistricting, they will do that. But in fact, there is an opportunity as with yesterday's news for the governor and our legislative friends to take some additional action on vaccine mandates and federal overreach. There are at least a few members of the audience who want to know from you what they need to do specifically. In other words, in short, what can the Texas legislature do in addition to what they've already done to show the president and his allies in Congress that Texas is not going to stand for it? Yeah, you know, I've been, I don't want to get too far over my skis here because I've been having a few private conversations with some folks in the legislature about what those might look like. And I don't sure. want to get in front of that too much. But what I want to say is a couple of things. I mean, one, Texas could take the position to require, uh, you know, take kind of the opposite position, right? And just say, no, you businesses cannot do that. And in fact, there'll be consequences if you do to set up the fight and set up the tension to encourage businesses to follow Texas law and not follow the federal, I think, unconstitutional orders. But that's sticky, right? Because, you know, to the previous question, I don't really want to put a Texan in a bad place because right. what we need is, is we need basically the comfort of the state backing up Texans to say no to the feds. So whatever we can do to hold that line. So, for example, I believe that the governor and the legislature ought to take the leverage of the things that we know we can lever and push back on Washington. For example, and you don't need the legislative session to do this. Do we, for the sake of border security or do we in response to this, say, Sorry, America, the I-35 corridor is shut down. You're not going to get your cheap goods out of Mexico. And we're just saying we've got an emergency with our border and it's shut down. Now, that's a big step. That might have negative consequences to Texas. We got to think through things like that. But we're at that level. Like we're at DEFCON 1, if you will, you know, where we've got to make decisions of what to do. I think the legislature ought to speak clearly. I think they ought to speak clearly about the position they take, about what businesses can and can't do. And also be careful about how far we go in mandating what businesses must do, right? We're liberty lovers in Texas. But at the end of the day, we're liberty lovers to preserve individual liberty and freedom and not allow essentially corporate America to run over us. And the corporate oligarchy that is currently in big healthcare and big tech, frankly, big everything, is currently running over a lot of Americans and Texans. And I think the legislature ought to try to hold the line the best it can. Yeah. And, and, and just to make one comment before moving on to additional question. No doubt Big Pharma, another big, was, yeah. was behind yesterday's announcement by President Biden. We could do a live stream on that, Congressman. But yeah. moving on, a member of the audience asks, how do we the people take away the government's money when we're taxed for it? How do we, in other words, cut off the government spending at the federal level in the same way that the Texas legislature has taken some steps to restrain their own spending? Yeah, I mean, the fundamental difference between Texas and the United States government is that the United States government can print money, right? That's the fundamental difference, and that's the problem. And you got a bunch of people buying into quote unquote modern monetary theory and these ideas that there's no ramifications to continuing to print money. It's false. That will come back to bite us. So we've got to hold the line. For the reasons I've already articulated, we're funding tyranny, but also ultimately we're going to fund our financial demise if we just keep printing money we, we, we can't back up. What I would tell you is there's been a lot of, I think, shiny objects preventing us from actually doing the hard work of figuring out how to limit spending. Things like the balanced budget amendment. I support it, I'm for it, but guess what? It's gonna take work to get that passed that we have thus far failed to do. Why don't we put more things we can do by majority vote, more restrictions and limits on our elected leaders? So for example, I would prefer that we go to a two year budget and appropriation cycle where we have to come in when we first come into Congress and we're limited to only focus on the spending bills and budget before we can do any other the oversight or any other general matter legislation. We can restrict ourselves on how we operate. Why don't we do that? We, that would give us more debate about the spending and we'd only do it every two years. Texas legislature style, right? Yep. Keep in mind the Texas legislature, they come in and they meet for the four or five months to come in, in the spring and then they're done and they have to get it done and or they're going to be back in a special session, which they don't want to do. And they're prohibited from raising money during that time. Maybe we should adopt a similar rule. Maybe we should require and say that if anyone votes for a certain level of spending, 
They can no longer be a committee chair in leadership or get paid. We can do all of that by majority vote. Like We ought to start thinking real quick and real hard on what we need to do to kick members of Congress in the behind to actually do what they're supposed to do and not sit out here in theoretical land about balanced budget amendments, uh, which Congress will find a way to end run in the end. Let's go stick it to Congress and make them follow some rules to do their job. That would be my view. Yeah, great. Well, look, uh, I, I know you've got a busy schedule today. And so I want to ask you two more questions, one from the audience and then one for me, and, and, and I'll be brief. The audience question, these are both looking ahead questions. And I know you and I have, have punched pretty hard today about, as I like to say, reading reality truthfully. I think that's the first step in, in implementing some solutions. So this audience member asks, uh, people are frustrated. There, there's a lot going on. Um, it seems as if sometimes conservatives are asleep at the wheel. Do you believe that the conservative movement today and over the next several months is organized enough and has enough good plans to implement that we're going to win? And by that, I don't take to mean just in 2022 and 2024, but when, like save this country. So I think the answer to that is uh, to be determined. And, and, and that's my putting my optimistic hat on of saying that what I'm seeing when I go around Texas, uh, whether it's the guy I just talked about when I ran into him and in, in, uh, tractor supply or whether it's talking to donors or whether it's talking to hardcore activists, there's a lot of anger and a lot of but yet energy and enthusiasm to focus on, I think, frankly, for the first time in a while, the right things and the prize, focusing on school boards, focusing on local elections focusing on the things that we really think matter, putting heat locally and on the state to hold the line. We cannot win this if we don't have a really strong Texas or a really strong state for all of your non-Texans uh, tuning in. So I'm optimistic from that standpoint. There is energy and enthusiasm and a desire to go fight and save this country. When that man that I was just talking to broke up and choked up about his dad who stormed Normandy, we all have that feeling. I will tell you that it is really important that we start to set our terms. I'm starting to speak in these, these terms, so to speak, where I'm saying, look, July 2026 is our 250th birthday, come July 2nd, technically. And so we're in a less than five-year countdown. What are we going to do? And the reason I'm focusing on 2026 is exactly what you just said, Kevin. It's not about 2022. That's political power. It's not about 2024. That's political power, no matter who runs, whether President Trump or DeSantis or whoever it may be. Let's focus a little beyond that. And in 2026, are we going to have a country, 250 years, that is still the beacon for hope and opportunity for the world in defense of the blessings of liberty that the Constitution was structured to protect? The answer to that better be yes, or we're going to have to do some real soul searching. And I think that is our calling. Nothing more, nothing less. And we need to get busy asserting the terms of what we expect from our government, because it is we, the people who give power to the government. And I know there's some words we hear all the time. Mm -hmm. I, we have to mean that right now. That's what that's about. And if we do that, we will win because Americans want that. But we got to get busy. and We got to move quickly over the next, I think, roughly five years to do that. Yeah, well, you, you've answered the, the second question I've asked you before. It's the proverbial question about why you woke up optimistic. And I love asking you that question because you're always realistic. And so let me ask you a, a different version of that, which is perhaps even more appropriate, considering that tomorrow is the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. Yep. Those of us who are adults remember vividly where we were on that day, what happened on that day. The last few weeks, I visited the 9-11 memorials for the first time with my 16 year old son, it was other than personal things like getting married and having children, the most moving experience in my life. All of that to say, let's just bring this conversation full circle, Chip. We wake up tomorrow, it's 9-11. We're worried about the country. We're, we're worried about what's happened the last 18 months. We're worried about what's gonna happen the, the next 18. What's the one thing we can do tomorrow, 9-11, that begins to implement what you just said, that when we celebrate our, the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, that we can look back and say, man, that was the turning point, and we have begun to take this country back. Well, I'm going to cheat being the politician that I am, and I'm going to say two or three things. Um, I knew that. That's why I said one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, one is prayer. Yeah. 
nothing more important. When I have people that I represent come out and tell me they're praying for me, I tell them that is much better than money, that's much better than emails, much better than coming to rallies. Pray. There is power in prayer. There's power in putting our faith in the Almighty and what He can do when we do that, number one. Number two, you must focus locally up. Stop getting distracted by the shiny objects on the news, on Fox, Newsmax, OAN, whatever you're watching, and chasing every rabbit trail online. Get off social media, focus locally, take over your school boards, take over your local elections, get involved. If you have worried about election fraud, go be a monitor, go to the elections, pay attention. Your only way your vote's not going to count for sure is if you don't make it. So go vote and then go make sure that the elections are working the way they should now that we pass good reform in Austin and other states who are watching. And three, related to number two, organize. Social media, and I'm, I'm guilty of this, has created an environment where we think we just pop off and we sound off and we're done. You can't. We have to organize. We have to strategize. We have to have a plan. If you're that business owner who asked that question a minute ago saying, what do I do? Go, go sit down with associations with 50 other business owners. Go find a lawyer that's going to go fight for all of you. Go talk to the governor's office. Go talk to the local chambers and say, I can't do this in good conscience and have a free country. What can we do to, together? Don't just give up. Don't just walk away. Don't, don't quit because you think, well, I'm going to quit and, and, and you know, object. No, band together and go fight this stuff. If we do those three things, pray, focus locally, and then when we're getting this fight, organize instead of just popping off, we can win this fight because we're Americans and that's what we do and that's who we are. Yeah, what a, what a, a great charge for us and a wonderful way to honor the, the memory, the sacrifice of the first responders on 9-11, the guys and gals who charged the cockpit on Flight 93. As you said earlier, those whose lives were lost in, in Afghanistan, those who served in Afghanistan and still with us, that America is a place that sometimes goes through cycles. And I would argue that we're in an ebb right now, not exclusively related to President Biden, but he surely isn't helping. Let's start with prayer. Let's this weekend, 9-11, or whenever you're watching this, if you're watching it re uh, recorded basis, that very next day, go out and start locally. Congressman Chip Roy, you're a national treasure. Thanks for being a great patriot. God bless you. Those of you who've joined us in this audience, may the Lord continue to prosper the work of your hands and may he continue to bless this great country. Take care. Thanks, Kevin.